What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Before the Whistle. I'm your host, Maddie Hudak, and we're in a bit of a dead period here, both in college and the pros. Uh, the New Orleans Saints start OTAs today, and we'll recap how that goes in later episodes. You know, as I've been thinking about what to talk about each week on the show, I find myself at this point in the offseason drawing on whatever is taking up my mind at the time. These last two few weeks, that's really been the draft and the transition over to the NFL process from college football. As most of you know by now, I'm Tulane sideline reporter, and I also cover the Saints on a few different mediums, but I started out as a writer first, and I still like to flex, flex that muscle uh, time and time again. So I had interviewed and did a piece last week on former Tulane linebacker Nick Anderson, who signed with the Saints as an undrafted free agent. And he had really previously inspired a conversation on an earlier episode of this show about that hypothetical five-round draft with an emphasis on a larger free agency signing period. The idea was to award players more agency and the ability to make a decision on their future. Draft prospects spend about 15 or so years making all these careful choices to get them to that day in April. You know, what peewee league did they sign up for? what district they're in that will dictate what high school they play football at. Their ability to attend local camps if their family has a means. Picking the right college to succeed in, which essentially used to be a four-year decision. Whether or not to opt in or out of a bowl game. Which agency they end up signing with in the end. After all of that, they're really at the mercy of college showcase invites the NFL combine, and the decision makers at the front of 32 teams. For some, like Nick Anderson, they'll just have one shot at their local pro day. And if they're lucky to be drafted, they better equally hope that the team that drafted them is the right fit. Just listening to Nick tell his experience of day three of the NFL draft just emphasized how meaningless this that day can be to players it means everything too. And how often seventh round draft picks are used as trade capital rather than to deliberately select any player. So if you ask me, Nick's best chance at success was always landing with the right team in free agency, which didn't used to exist in the NFL. As I had said on that episode about that hypothetical draft, uh, as much as change is really unrealistic to happen in this league, the players have shown before that they have the power to do so. Just looking back at the history of the NFL, if you will, uh, before 1947, teams had what was called the reserve rule, which this is all going to be about free agency, but basically meant that teams could keep this clause in a contract that allowed them to keep signing players over and over to the same one year deal that included this contract. So it was just an endless loop, basically, of holding player rights until eternity trading them, or that player ended up retiring. Unsurprisingly, the players demanded having some more agency. So the NFL created the one-year option rule, and that lasted through 1962. That restricted teams to a one-time usage of the above clause, and after that contract expired with said clause in it, they couldn't include it in the next contract, which would be called their option year, after which players were free to negotiate and sign with other teams. First NFL free agent technically was a 49ers wide receiver, R.C. Owens, who played that option year out. Then he went and signed with the then Baltimore Colts. As you can imagine, naturally, the 49ers owner was not thrilled by this uh, result. And then Commissioner Pete Rozelle instituted the Rozelle rule the next year. In essence, it made Rozelle god of trades. At his final and conclusive discretion, he would decide what to award as compensation from teams signing a free agent to the team losing the free agent, unless they agreed upon some package prior. As you can imagine, that was about as problematic as you could expect. Could you picture that rule being in effect today? So the NFL Players Association challenged that in 1976 when they filed a lawsuit, Mackey versus the NFL, where they alleged that the NFL was violating Section 1 of the Sherman Act, which deals with unreasonable restrictions on free trade. So then they moved to, quote, plan B, free agency. Out of the 47 players at the time uh, that made up a roster, it's now up to 53, 
teams could protect 37 of those players with the right of first refusal, which exists today. Basically saying a team can either match an offer from another team that comes in or as awarded draft compensation for it. It also provided a, a comp structure that wasn't just simply the commissioner throwing up his hands and deciding on his final and conclusive discretion. Wild. As you might guess, that's where the origins of the franchise tag and restricted free agency came from. As you might also guess, usually those 37 players were the best ones and would be the most lucrative free agents if they were allowed to be them. So a few of them ended up suing the NFL. And a U.S. District Court judge had awarded a temporary five-day restraining order while they were putting in place an evidentiary hearing that allowed those plaintiffs to be able to sign with another team during that time. Three of the four of them ended up on a new team in five days. Then the next year in 1993, we got as a result what we now know as NFL free agency. It absolutely increased parity and competitive balance in the league. It put emphasis on the draft, but really it disallowed teams from bankrolling dynasties on these continual one-year deals for decades. It's hard to say the league isn't better off as a result. And then you look at college, which took until 2018 to even have a transfer portal. Prior to that, players had to actually get permission from their coaches to contact other schools, which probably as awkward as you can imagine, instead of just contacting the school administrator and telling them they want to enter the transfer portal, can also alert their coach, but they don't have to. They had to in the past and actually get permission from them. After they obtain that permission, then they'd have to go back to the school administrator, tell them what schools they're interested in. Then they would have to send these forms out to all of those schools. And you would have to find a way to get the word out that you were available and figure out where you could land. And similarly, on the receiving end or the losing end, coaches either way would have to use their connections and word of mouth, essentially, to figure out who they could identify as potential athletes that would be transferring. So they created the transfer portal, which has literally changed every year since its inception, it seems. This year, we saw them uh, institute a new 60-day window for athletes to enter their names in the portal. And that varies by each sport and you know, when those periods are. For football, there's a 45-day period that starts on the Monday after bowl game and college playoff selections, and then a 15-day period later in the spring. And yes, uh, players can absolutely withdraw their name and stay at the team that they were at after entering the portal, but the team that they're on can also pull their scholarship at the end of the term if they enter the portal. The idea being that this risk that the players have incurred awards them more accountability in making their decisions, as if they were allowed to have any type of decision like this in the first place prior to the transfer portal. And you used to have to sit out for a year. Now they have a one-time rule for undergraduates, and there's exceptions, obviously, in the case of athlete, physical, and mental well-being and exigent circumstances. But for now, undergraduates are allowed to transfer one time without losing you know, a year of having to play. So a, a player that has the season of their life that felt like they got snubbed on their offers out of high school can transfer up into a better conference. Go seek what they think is an opportunity to obtain better NIL deals where they see a better pathway to the NFL. And maybe that latter issue or that latter point is really the issue in the first place. The NCAA had conducted a study on D1 college athletes back in 2020, looking at what their motivations were for choosing a school, how their recruiting process went, what factored in. And they asked uh, each sport, but about 70% of, college football players listed becoming a professional athlete as somewhat likely to happen. 70%. Looking at the numbers of who actually makes it to the NFL, the odds are really, really not in anyone's favor there. At a given time, there's about a million players in the high school level in the United States. Of that 1 million players, about 7.3% make it to the NCAA level, which comes out to about 73,000. So of that 73,000, about 1.6 of them end up becoming draft eligible. 
brings you down to about 16,000 from the 1 million number we were just at. And of those 16,000, about 260 players are drafted, which comes out to, of the draft eligible NCAA pool, 0.016%. Essentially rounded up 0.02% of getting drafted. That's really low for every single player, despite 70% of them thinking it's somewhat likely that they're going to become a professional athlete. And sure, there's free agency, which I just talked about, but most pathways to success come through the NFL draft. It's definitely worth noting that at the time of the survey, there was no NIL in 2020. I'm sure that would become a factor in a lot of those survey questions. Maybe NIL is really where this all comes down to. And if that ends up being the case, I think I'd be willing to live with that. Just when you look at otherwise, these players had to have these NFL dreams in the past. Otherwise, they're just playing for a free education. Don't get me wrong. It's still an incredible deal for most and arguably more important when you look at how many players actually make it to the pros. But just talking about motivation and everything involved here, and the fact that it's really hard to argue, if nothing else, then the sheer a lot of time that the quality of player educations is not affected by playing a D1 sport like college football. There's certainly a mess of factors involved when you get away from a microscopic level, like focusing on just one male sport. But for now, I just think about how much time I spend covering Tulane football as their sideline reporter. And I also went there for undergraduate. So I think about how much time I spent on average on my education there. And yeah, the football players have a completely different trajectory in the spring and the fall semesters. But in the fall, it practices five days a week, including those early hour meetings before said practice, meetings thereafter, medical treatment, etc. Then on away game weeks, we end up traveling on Friday typically. And so if a player has class on that day or wanted to schedule themselves in a class, but couldn't because they had required attendance on Fridays, yada, yada, they have to miss class, reschedule any tests that they might have. It's not the worst thing in the world. And I'm not going to act like I attended every class. Players also get one-on-one tutoring. So I'm not trying to argue that this is apples to apples, but just again, thinking about obtaining my degree there, I really can't imagine adding on as someone that used to play competitive sports, playing a competitive sport at that level or working at any of the internships I did that I guess my first pathway, but set me up for what I thought my career was going to be out of school. Can't see myself having time for any of that. And honestly, I'll just say it. A lot of these players are going to end up with CTE down the line. Even if not that, they've still sacrificed their bodies for a very violent sport and are going to pay the price in that. They might end up getting arthritis and can't type anymore at their job. Back issues lead to them having issues staying at work and making money down the line. They might not have CTE if they're lucky, but they had six concussions and their short-term memory is shot. All of these things that are going to affect them and their careers long-term. So if the solution for that is unregulated NIL, I think I'd rather err on the side of the NF- on, on the NIL. Now, of course, a lot of this went on before under the table before the Supreme Court opened up the NIL Wild West. But did we have to strip Reggie Bush's Heisman Trophy in the meantime? You know, it's reasonable that for a sport that has produced multi-million dollar contracts in multiple conferences for television broadcast rights, Increased ticket revenue, the revenue from merchandise, all of the revenue that goes on to college sports, including an effect on, I believe, the application and admission rates for teams that are doing well in sports, that said players of said sports shouldn't be awarded any form of compensation for that. But the problem is, we, and that's what happens when something is deemed unconstitutional, is we went from completely nothing to everything all at once. If NIL is, I guess, a substitution for contract deals and and revenue that players would get from that in the NFL and endorsement brand deals and the like, then the transfer portal is the substitute for free agency. Since we're about to enter summer, these are things that I might look at more in somewhat of a long-form series on 
what on earth is going on with all of the changes and continuously at that in college sports. Because in contrast, you know, well, the NFL has defined periods for each aspect of their process. And in comparison, college is just ridiculously unregulated. Yeah, they're defined windows for the transfer portal. Went over this before, but just to give those specifics, it enter uh, it opens on December 5th and players have a 45-day window after that. And then it opens up one more time on April 15th, closes the 30th, so 60 total days to enter the portal. And once you enter the portal, you're not on any timeline after the fact. You could be in the portal forever, but the restrictions are just on actually putting your name in the portal, taking the risk of losing your scholarship in the process. Here's the issue. I don't know why I just did all that with my hands. The NFL implemented free agency in the first place to deal with monopolies that these teams were holding on both player contracts and the subsequent team success. These dynasty teams that just no one had any ability to compete with. Unfortunately, when you look at it from the time of what was the one-year option rule in 1947, it literally took 46 years to get to what we know as free agency now. Multiple lawsuits along the way. But when you look at the difference between college and the pros, one thing sticks out to me the most, and it's there's these tiers that exist in college that just don't in the NFL. You have the FCS, you have the FBS, you have Division I, Division II, Division Three. but when you're talking about the top level, you have these two distinguishing divisions, Power Five and Group of Five. Those terms essentially define 10 conferences that make up the NCAA uh, Division I FBS subdivision, which is the Football Bowl subdivision, the FCS being the subdivision Trey Lance came in. Power Five, though, and we all are familiar with this, it's the SEC, the ACC, Big Ten, Big 12, Pac-12. That's your Power Five. That refers to the five conferences that A, all have larger institutional control, much larger television contracts and automatic bids in some sort to the New Year's Six, which are the six bowl games played around New Year's, including the Cotton Bowl. The champions of each Power Five conference are required in that 12-team selection. And then each conference has a tie-in with the game. So it depends, you know, which team, or I'm sorry, you know, which game that they're going to get selected to, but they all have these guarantees, each one of them, of the Power Five. Then the highest ranking champion from the entirety of the group of five is guaranteed a berth barring a impossible playoff bid prior to the upcoming 12 team expansion. Uh, The group of five referring to the remaining five conferences that make up the FBS division. I guess you'd say uh, five conferences that are worse off than the power five, better off than everyone else. Um, Ultimately, you're fighting for one piece of the pie versus 11 pieces split up amongst the Power Five. There's just such a severe disadvantage of access to the New Year's Six and college football playoffs, all based on this select, selective, uh, subjective selection process that also involves subjective rankings. So now those players at Group of Five schools can look at a better path to those six bowl games or better NIL deals, whatever they define, I guess, as their best or better opportunity. That's not like uh, tampering and everything wasn't going on with the last, before the last five years, but I don't know what I just said. (laughs) It's not like tampering wasn't going on for the last five years, but with this new age of NIL coming into play in 2021, We just have seemed to, again, transition into another lawless era. Before, a group of five program and coaches, I guess, could really thrive on finding diamonds in the rough, cultivating that talent. Now, if you develop a player, make it onto the field, and they do well, you're now running a risk of having to field off incoming offers from other schools. Just when you talk to players on one-offs and passing, they'll mention hearing offers or or feelers from other schools when they never actually enter the portal at all. It does make it extremely hard for G5 programs to maintain success and find, I guess, motivation in, sure, this expanded playoff era, which will be coming in the 2024 season, where they'll have an automatic bid to the college football playoffs, but with what team that they're able to field that hasn't been poached by 
the power five and the transfer portal. I've been sitting here and trying to think to what solutions there are for this conundrum that I guess just has way too many factors and frankly, absolutely no oversight. I played around in my head with an idea that involved capping teams at a certain number of transfers and perhaps that's feasible. There actually was a 25 man limit until last season where they relaxed that for two years, probably going to end up getting rid of it, but why not just say that where teams could only assign 25 new players to a season. So if a team lost 45 players to the transfer portal, how are they supposed to make up for that deficit? And is a player safety thing, if nothing else. So they got rid of that, I guess. They relaxed it and still in a transition period of trying to make decisions here. I guess that makes sense. It was posited as the simpler solution. I don't know when the simpler solution translated to the best solution, though. And I think there is merit in a system where you could swap players in the portal based on how many you lost in addition to that 25-man limit. But that also doesn't really account for the discrepancy or of or the issue of parity and bridging that gap from Power 5 to G5. And, you know, I was trying to think of a two-for-one thing, but it, it's difficult without there being an explicit acknowledgement other than the rules for the New Year's Six that the group of five is at, you know, a competitive disadvantage here as a result of this transfer portal. But let's dig even deeper here. With no rules to be had, that also applies to the coaching staffs, what coaches can do and can't do. It's a new thing that the NCAA has implemented, and I believe it's this year, it was last year, where if a player transfers to a different school and they were on a scholarship, they're now guaranteed financial aid through graduation of that new school. They also limit players to a one-time transfer free, uh, free of a redshirt year if they're an undergrad, And it's limitless, I guess, in the graduate situation. I don't know how much you guys have looked at this, but just look quickly at what's going on in Colorado with Deion Sanders. It's not just a question of decimating a roster and filling a ton of scholarship spots with players that haven't played a down of football together and whether or not that translates to on-field success and, I guess, off-field success in building a culture of decimation. but. It's really about the players here that were pushed into the portal. And notably, most of them were quote unquote cut after the spring game. And at that point, that's kind of the last chance for players. And yeah, in in cases of tampering, I'm sure that it works out a lot easier for players to end up making that swap in the spring. But timing wise, you're looking at slim pickings from universities that have mostly settled on a depth chart for the most part. You might get lucky and find somewhere that you might have a need, that they might have a need. Probably has less NIL deals. You know, they're just, we're taking away the actual factors for a player to make a decision. Also, transferring at that time means that you don't get to go through spring practice and try out a coaching staff or try out a new team. And you only have a 15-day window at that point to decide. And remember, once you enter the portal, your school is no longer required to give you your scholarship back. And without the portal, you can't exactly kick players off of four-year scholarships, but coaches can essentially push them out the door by telling them that they're not going to have any playing time the next season. So there's where your decision comes down to, where you technically can't enter, or I'm sorry, you can't technically be in contact with other schools until you enter the transfer portal. And let's be honest, most that are pushed there in this situation I'm talking about aren't exactly fielding off endless Power 5 offers. It's a really hasten two-week period to decide all that. Because if you don't enter it, unless you're cool with tampering, it's hard to find out if another school is going to offer you any playing time. But the second that you do, your scholarship is no longer guaranteed by the school that you're entering the portal from. That's probably the point of what Sanders was trying to do. You can't force a player to enter the portal, but you can tell them they're not going to see the field. And in order to really have contact with other universities, unless you're telling them to go about it the wrong way, they have to enter the portal to be able to even do so. Here we are in this catch-22. Catch-22 a step further 
what if those players had already transferred as undergraduates and were still undergraduates to Colorado? Now they have to choose a school to sit out a year at? My mind has kind of settled on that being the crux of the issue here. Or in this situation specifically, say a player had already transferred to Colorado, a new coaching staff comes in and they tell them, you don't have a spot on the team, better go enter the portal. So your choices are to enter the portal and essentially find a team that's going to say, yeah, we're going to have a spot for you in the season after this next season. We're going to award a scholarship to a player that's going to sit out for a year. And sure, if you're a really good player, you'll probably get those offers. Again, the situation we're talking about that has essentially been created by the coaching staff at Colorado, those players are probably not in that position. So they have to choose where they might see success in a year after the fact and try to make a difference and stay in the conversation in that year off to potentially succeed at a new school and not actually get to get their feet wet. Or they stay at what honestly would just end up being a a toxic work environment. And as someone that has worked in toxic work environments before, it's not worth it. And I would encourage every player in a bad coaching situation to get out of that. But they can't exactly do that anymore. And and so they're stuck a lot of the time without that choice, thinking maybe I'll enter the portal during the 45-day period after this next season where I can get at least better options than what I'm going to get fielded as offers in the spring. Or I guess you're hoping to land on a team that might have its depth chart settled. Anyways, I've read things that have said that all of that with regards to Colorado and how coaches have kind of played with the transfer portal, it's somewhat of a necessary balance after the players were awarded too much freedom. Were they really? I didn't really have to take too many steps away from an actual legitimate situation into a hypothetical one to already come up with a conundrum of issues going on here. Yeah, players can obtain NIL deals for the first time. They can transfer without consequence. One time. Meanwhile, their head coach or their position group coach, their strength and conditioning coach, whatever is most important to them, they can take new jobs at the ready. I think that's where you see a lot of spring transfers as a result. And really where we should be going with this is probably a hiring period for coaching staffs to award players some form of stability because otherwise we're just holding them to arbitrary timelines that technically are only being restricted by the NCAA because they wanted to stop these mid-season transfers and right before the season kind of thing. I think you can also give players a little more freedom there when you're allowed to take a new job at a new school, take another job at another new school. You know, coaches just, they don't have to honor a deal because they're not bound by it in the way that these athletes, I guess, are now required to, at least after they transfer one time, adhere to that loyalty, if you will. And again, not far away from a legitimate situation because I mean, I just don't know. I haven't looked that much into Colorado in terms of the players that were pushed into the portal, whether or not one of them had already transferred to Colorado, but we're one step away from that situation becoming a reality. And that it's an issue with the system, but it's the complete abuse of it by coaches that because they've been forced to go under the table for so many years, pretty adept at figuring out how to skirt the rules as they come along. It's not a secret to me. And then you think about the fact that tampering is all but you know the worst kept secret in the NCAA right now, and yet there's really no consequences. Teams are allowed to just pretend like none of this discourse is happening. So much more power still remains with the coaching staffs and the league than it does with the players. Players have a 60-day window to decide whether to risk their scholarship, potentially not find another one, just to legally converse with teams, or they have to tamper behind the scenes to the detriment of that program. And when you look at who's really good at NIL deals and who's not, yeah, you can obtain NIL, but we're really in a landscape that if you're good at social media and have that literacy more than anything, that's what's going to benefit you the most. Not that it's irrelevant, but 
none of that, it doesn't award them anything at the expense of a team. And they're not taking an NIL deal from a school that then can't offer that to someone else. I mean, that comes from the collective, but there's no trade-off. Except a team losing a player and that team getting, or that player getting to go onto a new team, there's no ability to be traded. And yeah, they can transfer one time and start over, but only one time as an undergrad. As much freedom as we say they have, we're really boiling it all down to one choice as a one-off. And really, when you look at the players that end up going into the draft and succeeding in the NFL, they're usually guys that played three to four years at school, didn't need to go back and get a grad degree and more playing time accordingly. So those are probably the most important players to your team or your undergrad. Probably the most important ones to cultivate as pathways to the NFL, because when you're recruiting them out of high school to come to you, that's what they, that's, what's going to be important. But then they make that one choice and they get one more time to decide if that was the right call or not. Even though they're probably the ones that are most likely to have a path to succeed. And I guess, yeah, you can plug holes with grad transfers, but now we're in that talk, kind of like the hypothetical draft thing I was talking about, where at a point players become pawns that are you know, traded seventh round picks rather than actually trying to do anything with them. That's kind of what's going on here, to be honest with you. And that's also not in the best interest of the player. It's in the best interest of the team, which can often be in the best interest of the player, but Again, we're trying to look at what entices a player to choose your school. You'd think that this one-time transfer rule would convince players to stay put more often than not. Obviously, as we can see, it's really not the case here. But imagine that you're a G5 coach and you're recruiting this player in the portal really hard. And before the NIL era, you were only fighting about the playing field itself. But as much as NIL helps... It's also this new element of persuasion that the coaches don't have any uh, ability to offer. I was saying before um, how it comes from collectives, if anything. You know, schools can't convince players to come directly through NIL money. But, you know, if you were a G5 coach that had recruited a player really hard out of high school and then they went to a Power 5 school because of an NIL deal, if they enter the transfer portal, then... You could see something where you got the NIL deal already. Do you want to have a pathway to the NFL and see that ability to recruit there? And as we're seeing now, you could get guys from Power 5 schools that aren't seeing the playing field enough and want more playing time to come down to a G5 program. Probably losing twice as many G5 guys, though, in the meantime. All coaches have at this point, with, with all of these restrictions being free and, and whatnot, and, and same with the players, but... Let's be honest, the talent probably matters more than players' words when it comes down to it. Coaches have the power of their word, and that's it. And I looked at that study again, uh, the NCAA study of goals in 2020, um, goals being an acronym for something. But in that same survey that asked about their perceived likelihood of becoming a professional athlete, those players were also asked whether they felt like what they were told during their recruitment about their role on their team ended up being accurate. 56% of D1 athletes agreed with that. Not to look at it negatively, but that also means that about nearly half of current D1 athletes feel that they were sold a magic pile of beans at their recruitment. And that was prior to the NIL and transfer portal really taking off these last two seasons, which awards players the ability to move more after the fact and also look for ways to fill those gaps, I guess, in expectations that aren't being met. Some players might meet that through NIL deals. Uh, on three, which is a recruiting website, they have their rankings in their database and have done a lot of work on how NIL deals are factored in because as much as this isn't a wild west of free deals, we don't really know much about any of it um, in terms of transparency of information here, but they did a survey of their top 200 players that they ranked in their database. 
85 of them responded and they asked them how NIL has really factored into their decision-making in more complex terms. One of the questions asked how, I guess I should say, one of them asked if they would be open to taking an NIL deal over better team fit. And about 30% of them said that they would be, again, open to it, which not necessarily saying that they would do that, but you also have to consider that when you're looking at the top 200 players, those guys probably have more of a decision in both program and NIL deals. But I think when you get to the motivations of a player, because D1 athletes don't just make up that power five group of uh, power five programs, it also has to deal with the group of five and the like. And going back to that survey where 70% of them think that it's somewhat likely they're going to become a professional athlete. I'd like to say that all of their motivations are probably more similar than not. So more applicable, I guess, than the NIL part is ranking what factors were most important than choosing a program of which they did actually rank NIL six, which was actually lower than I expected. The overwhelming response is the top factor was coaching staffs and NFL development. All going back to that expectations of this dream that less than 0.02% of college players will realize. Less than 0.02%. And that's the primary driving factor in a lot of these transfers decisions as well, more so than NIL. So if half, half the current athletes don't feel like they were told the truth in their recruitment, to me, that's a giant problem. Or, you know, a new coaching staff comes in that they don't gel with. So loyal players, I guess, in that instance, would be lucky to get out of Dodge scot-free. But suppose you transfer somewhere and that coach gets fired or takes a job elsewhere. Either way, they bring in a new staff, like Deion Sanders in Colorado. What if the player had transferred for a specific coach that ended up leaving for one reason? What if they stick around and the new coach is a bad communication fit for them, a bad personality fit for them, or is just straight up verbally abusive, which I think you run the risk of much more in college sports than you do with the pros, especially considering that they are impressionable 18 year olds that are a lot of the time looking for guidance and father figures that often come in the form of coaches. And I think a lot of coaches can take advantage of that. I just honestly think players are best off with continued free choice. This one-off transfer rule, I really think is a giant problem here. And I think it's really affecting both teams and players. You know, maybe cap it at two times freely, I guess, just more than one time. Because, you know, coaching staffs are also stuck with that scholarship now through its entirety. I haven't really seen much emphasis on, on that investment. What, again, if that player transferred, a new coach comes in and is stuck with that player's scholarship, even though they don't see a fit for that player on their team. So even if there isn't a new head coach, what if a coach meets with a player and both of them decide it's in your best interest for you to transfer? Except, oops, you already transferred here last year, so you can either sit out here or somewhere else and blame it on the portal. But you can't get your shot in the portal unless you enter it. In which case, we're probably going to take away your scholarship and give it to someone else. Or again, we could simply award these players more choice and more agency to see what they think their best pathway to the NFL is. I guess it just depends on how much we value the balance of player agency and power to the players. And it's one that I think is very on the verge of once the players all band together, they're going to see the same issues that the NFL had to deal with. And there might not be a CBA or anything right now, but with everything being left up to the states, there being no federal oversight, it's all coming towards them all being best off looking at what's in their best interests. And if you ask me, it's the ability to transfer more than once. And I think that allows teams to build better. Again, maybe it's twice. It just all comes back to 
human beings and relationships. But I just don't think that that could be more true than it is here. What you tell a player when they're recruited, I mean, it should matter. How you handle those off-season discussions, they matter with retaining players and finding a pathway for those players to succeed. Because again, word of mouth is still going to happen. And I think it matters how you handle players that you're helping out the door as much as you are coming to the door or handle people from pushing your door open and stealing your whole team. So how you handle uh, personality ego balance of a position group with incoming players in it that have guys that might've thought that they were next in line. How you handle the difficult discussion of really what their pathway is to the NFL. Again, I just think about Nick Anderson, the Tulane player who's defensive coordinator at his junior college told him not basically not to go to Ole Miss and choose this uh, alluring SEC dream of, you know, clout that won't actually see him get developed in order to enter the NFL draft or a pathway to the NFL. And I tend to do agree. And I think there is a lot of value there to be had for group of five teams where, yeah, the reality is, is again, we're talking about 1 million players and 0.016% of that. I'm just going to keep repeating it because it's wild are actually going to make it into the draft and the league. And then a smaller portion of that might make it as free agents into the league. But You know, they're just as good of a chance, especially if you look at situations where a guy is undersized or he has all the athletic traits. He's just a little slow at mental processing one way or the other. Either way, I think that they have the ability to cultivate those skill sets more at a lot of these G5 teams. So maybe they could see the beauty of, I, I guess, being farm teams if such thing as unlimited or expanded you know, transfer rules became the case. Because I think that's what you would see happen more often than not is G5 programs getting a bit decimated if their players could transfer at the ready. So I understand perhaps not giving free control. But I also think that with the restrictions on the transfer portal, but with how many of it have been lifted, it's really turned the, it's turned recruiting into an art is what it has. Uh, how a team handles it with their resources is on them, but it all is going to be a very delicate balancing act. And it's not just limited to recruiting them to get them to sign with your team out of high school anymore. It's it's this continuous recruiting process. And I think the sooner that teams pick up on that and have their finger on the pulse, the better, but none of this should come at the expense of player freedoms that were literally completely handcuffed until just recently. Again, no transfer portal at all until 2018. No NIL until 2021. But doing something so these players don't end up on that day in April regretting a decision that they were only allowed to make one time when they were 19 that they either had to stick with or miss risk missing a year of playing time in order to get out of. To emphasize staying in bad situations out of getting out of them. I know it's not exactly what it's saying in apples to apples direct comparison, but just going back to the situation at Colorado, what else are you telling those players? I could have gotten more conclusive, I guess, with my thoughts here, but that, that's really all I have to say on this long form take on the transfer portal, NIL, the changing college landscape, but I mean, the reality is, is it's a completely new landscape that I think we're still all trying to figure out how to get through on a daily basis, let alone uh, offer solutions for. And there are a ton of factors here. But even though this is a mostly NFL-focused show, the more I've worked in college football, the more I've really seen how directly and intricately connected the two are. And all these parallels that I never actually saw before. And as this college level keeps creeping closer to the NFL's model, it wouldn't be the worst thing to keep checking in on the history of things like free agency and when players were awarded agency and how we could look at that to apply it on a college level. Because ultimately, that's where you're getting your NFL teams from. And 
shouldn't we all ultimately at the end of the day want the best players playing the sport that we watch? And I think that that comes with the most freedom that they can have that doesn't completely upset a competitive balance. Now, sometimes there is no conclusion to necessarily be drawn. Normally not conversing with yourself, um, which entered this show. But as we move towards the more tangible offseason, I'll bring in things like OTAs, which again, begin today and get away from these hypotheticals. But in the meantime, if you continue to enjoy these, we just ask that you guys please remember to like and subscribe to the show on whichever platform you're using. Um, we're on Apple Podcasts. We're now on Spotify. We're on YouTube. And if you're watching on here, you have the benefit of seeing my very Monday outfit. Um, but every click counts, guys. And I appreciate you all for doing so. I hope, again, if you're a fan of the NFL, you can see why this matters just on a human being level or, uh, again, on a strategic level of are we developing the best players, even if you just restricted it to quarterback. So I think everyone, if you make it about quarterbacks, everyone cares. So if that's how we need to frame the discussion. Um, but I know that there are a lot more college fans out there than I expected really only covering the NFL up until now. And I know a lot of you are only interested in the college aspect, but I think seeing where these two leagues parallel in that both of them are continually evolving, there's a lot to be had there, especially when the uh, college level is evolving at such a rapid pace in quite literally annual t turnarounds at this point. Anyways, I'm going to head out, but I will see you guys on Friday.